Female sex hormones, they undergo oxidation in the liver, production in the liver, and they get sulfated and glucuronidated and conjugated. And just like all steroid hormones, if it's not conjugated to sugar, it won't get off the protein carrier. It's only when these hormones become conjugated to sugar that they end up coming off the carrier protein and going into the urine. It's only when they become conjugated to sugar that they come off the protein carrier and go into the urine. If you did not have them conjugated, they would not come off the protein carrier. If they didn't come off the protein carrier, they'd never go into the urine. Now, that's why when you conjugate the estrogen, it gets converted into the other estrogens, but it doesn't matter because functionally they're the same. And it doesn't matter these conversions because they all have the functionality that's identical. Your point is to know, just, just like all hormones, they are long half-life, they are lipid-soluble, they are bound to a protein carrier, and they don't go out into the urine under normal circumstances. In monitoring the menstrual cycle, we look at the amount of sex steroids by measuring them in the urine. And this allows us to monitor the menstrual cycle. Now, if you don't want to do anything with someone's menstrual cycle, it doesn't really matter. But what if you're trying very hard to be able to do in vitro fertilization? What if you're trying to get pregnant? Well, on the other hand, what if you're trying not to get pregnant? And you want to be able to know when people are naturally infertile. Well, both of these are true, but from the point of view of harvesting an egg to be able to be an egg donor or have in vitro fertilization, you need to be able to look at the sex steroids as they come into the urine. And they don't go into the urine until they're sugar-coated, glucuronidated. What's the difference between candy coating and glucuronidation? $40,000 a year worth of tuition, because when it gets candy-coated, the progesterone and estrogen metabolites now go into the urine. Just a spoonful of sugar makes the steroids go down. Yes, into your urine. And that's why we know the follicular phase, where you're at. Because the follicular phase is telling you when you're going to pop. Remember that when you plant seeds, not all the seeds bloom at the same time. So you plant the seeds, but the flowers, they come up at different time, and they bloom as the flowers. But when you cut the flower, all the flowers, they wilt at the same time. And that's why the luteal phase is fixed. Just like cut flowers all wilt at the same time, don't they? Because it's a cut flower. And the luteal phase lasts for 14 days. Fixed. Follicular phase. How long does it take those early seeds to grow up? A little variable. That's the question, by the way. They're going to say, which of the following is fixed, which is variable? Luteal fixed, follicular is variable. The luteal phase in pregnancy are characterized by progesterone. Progesterone. In gestation, in pregnancy, it's progesterone. Are you against gestation? No, I'm for gestation. You're for gestation, so you're pro-gestation. Yes, I'm pro-gestation. Well, what hormone do you have? Progesterone, because I'm pro-gestation. Good, I'm glad you're not anti-gestation. Progesterone is the characteristic hormone of the luteal phase in pregnancy because that's what maintains the gestation. Oh. Now, why in the later half is the progesterone falling? Because the luteal phase wears out, and as it wears out, it stops making progesterone. That's all. I don't know, why does your deodorant wear off? Because in the later half of the day, maybe it wears off some, or your perfume. And the progesterone wears off because the progesterone is the perfume of the corpus luteum that gives a new essence to the interior of the uterus. Estrogen is formed by taking off one carbon off of an androgen. Estrone is secreted from the ovary, and some of it's formed in adipose. That's a very good question about what is the major site of formation of estrogen in a person who is not female. And the answer is adipose tissue. Fat cells have aromatase. Isn't that interesting? And there's the main circulating estrogen following menopause. So that means fatter women are more womanly postmenopausal. Yes, that's true. Testosterone levels in men go down, but fatter men are more womanly. That's why grandpa, as he gets older, his testosterone goes down and estrogen goes up, and grandma is getting more difficult because her estrogen's going down, her testosterone's, her androgens are going up. 
So grandpa becomes chill and happy, and grandma becomes more difficult because of this reason. Stay fat, stay happy. So do not spend a long time learning the difference between the subtypes. They all function about the same. The only major difference is the potency between them. So that's the only significant difference between the different types of estrogen, their biological potency. Androgen formation has the same precursor steps as you do in the adrenals. DHEA, which is dehydroepiandrosterone, androstenedione, and all that happens differently in the gonads, the gonads go further. Male gonads can go into testosterone. Testosterone is also from peripheral conversion of the adrenal and ovarian androgens, but in normal persons, this should be a very small quantity. The point is, is that you should not be thinking that it's a different process than the precursors in the adrenals. It's just that gonads go further. A man has man boobs. When he's really fat, he gets big breasts. Why? Because of aromatase in adipose tissue. And some of the testosterone is converted to dihydrotestosterone. Now, this enzymatic reduction has enormous pathologic significance because we use treatments that inhibit 5-alpha reductase and prevent what diseases, reverse what diseases. 5-alpha reductase inhibitors will reverse benign prostatic hypertrophy, BPH, and baldness. It treats BPH and baldness. 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, finasteride, dutasteride. Those are the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. And they stop dihydrotestosterone. In a fetus, dihydrotestosterone makes the penis, the prostate, the scrotum. The penis, the prostate, the scrotum, PPS. The penis, the prostate, the scrotum, dihydrotestosterone. And in a fetus, dihydrotestosterone makes the penis, the prostate, and the scrotum. But in an adult male, it makes too much prostate. BPH, baldness. Testosterone internally makes the internal male structures. Testosterone internally makes the seminal vesicle, the epididymis, the vas deferens. The seminal vesicle, the epididymis, the vas deferens. And that's what testosterone does in a fetus. Vas deferens, seminal vesicle, epididymis. Remember, the follicular phase is variable, fluteal phase is fixed. Long cycles are usually due to variability in the follicular phase. And when he goes even cycle to cycle variability, they're going to ask you, what is changing? And the answer is not the duration of menstruation, it is the duration of the follicular phase. Once ovulation occurs, you're going to bleed in two weeks because the allutinizing hormone wears out, estrogen and progesterone go away. Cycle length minus 14 is the day of ovulation. Cycle length minus 14 days is the ovulation day. Let's get some definitions of some menstrual irregularities. First of all, amenorrhea is very simple. It's a lack of menstruation. It's absence of menstruation. It's absence of menstruation, but it just means a functional problem. For instance, we don't call it amenorrhea if a person comes in and says, I've had my uterus taken out. That's not what we mean by amenorrhea. It's kind of like somebody says, I have a headache, when somebody's hitting you in the head with a hammer. That's not what we generally mean by headache, somebody's being hit in the head with a hammer. Amenorrhea means i am got normal anatomy, but I ain't making no menstruation. Now, first of all, it just happens in some people. Number two, people who are really, really thin, really, very really thin ladies, get amenorrheic and menstrual abnormalities like oligomenorrhea, a decrease in the number of menstruation. Or you can have problems in your luteinizing hormone, FSH, LH, FSH, LH cycle, like Kalman syndrome. Kalman syndrome is associated with a bit of anosmia, too. You're functionally hypothalamic. In other words, you're not making LH and FSH. That's uh, uh, different from just saying amenorrhea and female athletes because it's a it's competitive survival advantage. For instance, if it's time for you to run away and save yourself to reproduce later, you don't want to get pregnant now under conditions of stress. So the body shuts off menstruation because nobody should be getting pregnant under conditions of starvation. Through the thousands of years of human history, about really about eight or 10,000 clearly recorded, and another 20,000 years of legend before then, there's been areas and times of starvation routinely. 
and no World Food Bank to come and rescue anybody. So what would happen in those times if you were not shutting off menstruation? You'd end up getting pregnant and conceive and give birth during a time of starvation. So the body shuts off the ability to reproduce during the time of starvation. And the body takes an eating disorder like anorexia is a form of starvation, isn't it? Yes, it is. Now, hypothyroidism does it for another reason. Hypothyroidism does it because when you have a low thyroid hormone level, you end up having an elevation of thyrotropin releasing hormone. And it turns out that at extremely high amounts, TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone, actually stimulates prolactin. Did you know that? Under excess conditions, TRH stimulates prolactin. That's also why prolactinomas do it, because they shut off menses, because prolactin inhibits menstruation. Now, what's the benefit of having prolactin inhibiting menstruation? Well, prolactin is always, of course, for lactation. Prolactin, a prolactin, prolactin. Are you against lactation? No, I'm here, I'm for lactation. So you could say you're prolactin. Well, yes, I am. So when you're trying to breastfeed one baby, it's the wrong time to conceive. Because it's like a really small, intimate French restaurant and you only have two seats. But you don't want to fill the other because you don't need anybody. You want to stay there and eat the two seats yourself. So if somebody comes to the door and says, hey, I'd like to conceive. I want to be a nude baby. And you have a little pituitary maitre d' that says, no, I'm sorry. Only two seats at the two breasts are filled. Come back in 9 or 12 or 18 months. I don't care. Go away. We shut off FSH and LH because we don't want any two people to be feeding at the same two breasts. We want to shut it off so you have one baby at a time. No baby left behind. Amenorrhea is the absence of menstruation. Now, when they're just decreased in number, we can call that oligomenorrhea, which is just a few menstruations. Sometimes people are menopausal early. It's like me being bald by the time I was 40. I mean, it just happens. Sometimes they fall out. So it's like male pattern hair loss of your ovaries. And anovulation can happen for people who just don't ovulate at all. Polycystic ovary is a completely unknown disorder of excess androgen. It's not so much a deficiency as estrogens. It's just that there's hyperactivity of DHEA, hyperactivity of androstene dion, hyperactivity of testosterone in polycystic ovary syndrome. Hypothyroidism does it because if my thyroid is slow, my pituitary gets mad because I basically, with my thyroid is slow, the hypothalamus makes more thyrotropin releasing hormone. The excess TRH stimulates prolactin. The excess TRH stimulates prolactin, and prolactin shuts off FSH and LH because that's how it makes sure there's only one baby at a time to breastfeed. Polycystic ovary syndrome is an idiopathic disorder. We just don't know what causes it. We know it's infertility and hirsutism. The hirsutism is because there's excess androgen. The obesity is not known. Now, the insulin resistance is just part of the syndrome. Part of it's related to obesity. Now, you get amenorrhea and oligomenorrhea because of excess androgens. Now, these excess androgens, like DHEA, happen in obese girls, and it was found out that when people were taking metformin, for their diabetes, they start getting pregnant because they were having unprotected sex because they like, man, I've been infertile my whole life. Now all of a sudden I'm having babies. Yeah, because people are getting pregnant by accident on metformin. I'd be like, wow, how'd that happen? And that's how this is discovered. Now, the interesting thing is, it's not so much that there's low estrogens, but excess androgens. And you don't have the ability to make the extra estrogens that you need. So the excess androgens give you hirsutism on your lip. I don't want all that hairiness on my lip. I'm a woman. Excess alopecia on your head. Hey, I want to keep my hair. I'm bald. Acne. Why do you get acne in polycystic ovary? Because there is a testosterone receptor on sebaceous glands. There's a testosterone receptor on sebaceous glands causing acne. Excess androgens are making it so you don't develop follicles inside your ovaries. And it doesn't matter what your LH levels are, they are not, you're never going to ovulate. And you get anovulation despite a high LH level. 
So the high LH level is also stimulating the theca cells, but the theca cells are making the DHEA without having the granulosa cells convert it to estrogen. And overall, what ends up happening? If you interrupt that LH surge, if you interrupt the LH cycling, you can't ovulate if you interrupt all the LH cycling. And the high insulin levels are because there's tissue resistance from obesity. Tissue resistance from obesity. And people get the enamenorrhea in polycystic ovary, get treated with metformin, and they both control their diabetes, and their ovaries come back to life. Spironolactone is anti-androgenic. I know that some of you may have read it before as being in the potassium sparing diuretic section of your books, but spironolactone is really used for its anti-androgenic component and to be used in people with CHF to lower mortality. Hirsutism. Hemsutism. Harrysutism. I'm feeling very woolly today. I got excessively a general pattern of hair growth on my nose and my legs. My, my nostril hairs are getting so large I can braid them. It's virilization also. You're deepening in the voice. Uh, my clitoris gets big in women. Increased muscle bulk and breast atrophy. Yes. And basically, these are androgen excess syndromes, such as giving from DHEA an increased testosterone. And you get axillary and pubic hair as low levels of androgens. And the hair in the chest and the face and the back gets more androgens and it becomes a male pattern hair loss. So basically your head becomes bald and your lips become hairy. The androgens are circulating as testosterone, DHEA. DHEA S means sulfated. And it's sulfated so it can go across barriers. For instance, it's sulfated. It's sulfated so it can go across barriers. And what that basically means is that you sulfate it so it can go into the placenta and across. Because sulfation is a way of taking a hormone and making it water soluble. How do you take a steroid hormone and make it water soluble? You sulfate it. And measurements of that sulfated levels and dexamethasone suppression testing, because dexamethasone should actually inhibit ACTH. So if you inhibit ACTH, you're shutting off the adrenal. You're shutting off adrenal androgens. That should be the normal effect of that to shut off the adrenal. Polycystic ovary is the most common cause of an ovarian excess syndrome. Polycystic ovary is a far more common thing than you might think. The polycystic ovary is people who have androgen excess of unclear etiology. Their theca cells are hyperreactive.